Well, hello there, students. Professor Giardina coming at you with um, our topic, The Play Ruined by Lynn Nottage and the concept of theater for social change. So here we are and let's get going. We have a beautiful image here of um, the arena stage in Washington, D.C., their production of uh, Lynn Nottage's play, Ruined. And um, I can't wait to to uh, have you all dig into the play and start reading it. it is absolutely one of my favorite plays it's just beautiful even with all its um, ugliness that's portrayed in this area of the world um, as we'll find out is um, you know uh, in the Congo but I can't wait for you all to read it because it just is so touching and it's so intense so let's get going so don't forget to go through your checklist for this week's topic here are your learning objectives for this particular topic. Make sure that you read them so you know what's expected of you. And then this is your slide that tells you to go ahead and read the play, take notes while you lead. And um, here are some focus and guiding questions for when you read the play and also for you to use for the lesson and lecture which you are partaking of now. All right, so those are gonna be helpful for you. All right, so we're going to start off with this idea, the necessity of theater. And you see, we've been on this great journey of the necessity of art and the necessity of performance and, and the necessity of theater. And um, I've given you a taste of a little bit of types of performances here and there, and we've experienced some live ones and we've read some. So we're here at this place called Why We Absolutely Need It. And this particular topic, theater for social change, we know now that theater can be a powerful vehicle. And we saw this in our storytelling unit, and we see this in um, the Greek and ancient times. So here we are, um, up until contemporary theater pieces that I'm introducing you to, and contemporary playwrights and contemporary actors. And so here is the longevity of the staying power in the uh, in the effect that a theater can have on a society. I have a couple quotes here, one coming from Paul Woodruff in his book called The Necessity of Theater. And it says, theater is necessary and inevitable because the ultimate goal of the human being is to be human and wise and blessed with this wisdom. If the objective of one's life were not to become human and wise, Theater would not have been initiated or performed, and we know this from our topic, What is Theater? And it helped the Greeks come up with democracy. Um, so, you know, it's just, there's one little tiny example how theater is so absolutely necessary. And then we have another quote here from Howard Stein, Theater as a Humanizing Force, and he says, every culture engages in theater, as Woodruff describes it, so he's referencing uh, our buddy up there, Paul Woodruff, that I just read to you, as he describes it in its variety of forms, in stage plays, rituals, weddings, funerals, and sports, and doesn't this list look very familiar to what we've already gone over at the beginning of the year, so it only makes sense that we're kind of closing the door on, on our journey together, coming full circle. Uh, he says, because theater ultimately serves to humanize members of that culture. And I believe this quote is absolutely 100% really vital and important to the encompassing ideas of this course. And one becomes human and aware of what it is to be human, thereby embarking on this path to wisdom. And here's the clincher, by watching and being watched. And we can use children as the perfect example of how they learn. They observe their parents, they observe their teachers, they observe one another. And innately, they observe without guessing or without judgment. And as we get older, you know, we have things that get in our way and, and then our attention and concentration gets pulled in many directions. Um, but children could be our example here. And, and so why is it called a play? We're playing. It, we're playing roles, uh, but we're doing it as an adult. Um, we're doing it on all levels, actually. So we can mirror life and learn from life and mirror societies and learn from other societies. So to sum up this slide, arts can bring about activism, which is the theater for social change. Art is built 
of actions. Art is a sum of actions, whether it be performance or singing or dance or visual arts or theater. It's a sum of actions. And then because an audience experiences it, it causes action. It causes an action within oneself if you allow yourself to be um, experiencing the art form. And then this essential action of the artist and then the audience is to see, experience, witness, and then derive from the witness. And then offer to give testimony. And then we can trust. So what can theater do? Well, we know this. And we have the functions and values list that we've been using all semester. But in a nutshell, it gives voice to the voiceless. It makes the invisible visible. So we're shining like a magnifying glass on society. It can challenge our worldview and it can make us care. And that's the thing that engages us as audience members. That's the thing that pulls us in, this idea of empathy. And we'll talk about that here a little bit in a little more. So before I get into this concept of empathy, which is, which is a driving force of audiences engaging and getting involved, is what is the job of the actor? Well, I have this great little snippet video here from Patsy Rodenberg, and she's a renowned vocal co coach and teacher with the Royal Shakespeare Company in England, and she has several books that she's written. I've actually used two of them in my studies as an actor, The Need for Words and The Actor Speaks, and it's oftentimes used for vocal training for actors. But she's also a, a humanist. She's an activist, and but in her professional life, she is, um, you know, a vocal teacher coach for professional actors, especially those performing Shakespeare. But um, what she has to say here begins to help identify this thing I'm trying to talk about in terms of empathy and, and, and engaging um, audience members through action and through the, the role or the job of the actor. So go ahead and take a look at that. It's not very long. All right, so you're back from watching the Patsy Rodenberg video snippet, um, and, and that whole lecture series was based upon her most um, um, recent book, uh, The Second Circle, and so they've broken it up there. If you ever wa want to watch more or read the book, that's the reference to that. But how do we do this? How do we do this as makers? How do we do... Um, you know, this thing that makes empathy. How do we do it? How do these actors that she's referencing do that? Well, um, it's a sum of parts. And you guys are having that experience of making your own piece of performance. And so what do we do? We, we watch our words as scholars and artists. We um, assume multiple viewpoints. Oftentimes, you know, we, we may not agree. But as artists or performers, we um, are trying to tell the full story. So we assume multiple viewpoints. We love our characters. We love all of them. And we get involved with all of them. Um, even if we hate them, we still love them. It's like a fine line. Um, and, and that's how they get so full and rich. We consider the other um, as artists when creating, whether it be writing a play or performing it on stage, a character. We consider the other side. We consider those parts of ourselves that we don't oftentimes use because we have to be truthful. We have to be truthful to that character. And this is a concept or an idea that was discussed in the acting topic. We present contrasting realities. If there weren't contrasting realities, everything would be all hunky-dory, utopia, and there'd never be any problems or conflict. Well, then we wouldn't have drama. We probably wouldn't learn anything either because out of, out of conflict arises innovation, right? Um, so we maintain this complexity in all its various forms, shapes, people, sizes, places, times, um, and this particular idea here, maintain the complexity, comes from the introduction part of the the book that you know the play that you're reading and I do want you to read the foreword and the afterword or the introduction and the um I think there's a little bit at the end of the at the end of the play but please read the entire thing there's a lot of little nuggets inside that introduction before the play starts in your book and if you haven't read it yet go ahead but this idea of maintaining the complexity is brought up in the introduction and then it's our job as as makers of theater and makers of art to ask why and what led to those actions and 
We speak about events around us in the world in terms of action and circumstance. So if we're mimicking or, or we're performing a metaphor for life, then we have to address that. We have to look at that. What, what led to those actions? And I love this little tiny thing here at the bottom. It says, remember in every good play, everyone is right. And that goes back to our playwriting lecture. I can't write um, Richard III or Darth Vader, if you will, if I don't love him in some manner. And that's how all the characters become fully rich and fully complex and fully truthful and believable entities um, surviving on the stage or on, on film. All right, so back to this idea of empathy. So I'm falling in love with Darth Vader, or I'm falling in love with Romeo or Juliet, um, but how am I going to make you care? How am I going to make you decide, wow, um, I, I, I'm really into this storyline? Because you see pieces of you there. You see pieces of humanity. You recognize things. They might not be things that you like. It's exposing things that are ugly and nasty and, and aren't right. Or they expose those things that are so wonderful and delightful and joyful. And that's how empathy is generated in a piece of theater. Um, and it's done for the actor as well. The actor goes through a very similar process that the audience does. It might be a little deeper, more intense, more analytical in order to get to the truth. But um, the actors have to do that too. They have to buy into um, the actions of the character. And when they do their job, then the audience is going to start buying into it too. And I don't know if buying is the right word, but it worked right then when I was telling you. But but what is empathy? It's this power of understanding and imaginatively entering into another person's feelings. Um, the act attribution to an object such as a work of art or of one's emotional intellectual feelings about it. And this is what the uh, dictionary has to say. But it's these elements and these forces that are all intertwined that pull at your gut and pull at your brain and pull at your heart and you may recognize all of them you may only recognize parts of them or some of them but something pulls at you so here it's feeling into or feeling with but it is not feeling for and um if we jump down to the last bullet there, empathy versus pity versus sympathy, they're quite different. And theater or art forms, they if they're done well and done correctly, it will generate empathy. And it won't make you just go, aw, and not do anything about it. it it will go, ah, oh, and then you want to talk about it or you want to do something about it. So that's the difference. Um, empathy is feeling with or into and sympathy is just feeling for, which stops. There's no, you know, through line after that. So um, good theater has that ability to generate empathy. And this play, if you haven't read it yet, will do that for you. So good actors don't judge their characters. They must just simply understand why they do what they do. And as soon as you unlock that key and you... Um, understand it and you believe it and you live it, then you're going to do the best job that you can at that job on stage. And playwrights go through a similar process too when they're loving their Darth Vader or their Romeo or Juliet. They don't judge them as they write them. They, they love them in a way that nurtures them into these full rich beings. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Lynn Nottage. Uh, Lynn Nottage won a Pulitzer for this particular play in 2009. Her plays often deal with the lives of African descent or African American and, and more importantly, African American women. This particular play is set in the Ituri region of the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. She based the play on a set of interviews of... Congolese women, and she actually um, went to Africa two or three times. I can't remember the number, but it's all in there in that introduction uh, to the play. So please do read that. I know I already said that, but I really want you to read it. Um, and the story is set in um, Mamanati's brothel or bar. Mamanati is probably the main character. 
and it's about a group of women caught in the middle of this war. So I'd like you to, um, if you haven't read the introduction yet, go ahead and do that. If you haven't read the play, go ahead and do that. And then come back and watch this uh, brief interview uh, with Lynn Nottage, the time frame in 2009 when the play uh, first came out. And then I have this beautiful image of a one woman from the Congo. And there's that quote again, which I absolutely adore, pulled out of the introduction and it says we must fight to sustain the complexities because we learn from the complexities all right so you you're getting closer now to really um you know getting the clearer picture what's this play about yes it's about women it's about trauma violence damage love war survival resiliency and the journey towards healing and we can see all of this inside of this this beautiful play and um we can see this from the characters in the play not all of them but um certainly uh, mama Nadi goes through a, a huge uh journey if you will so that's what this play is about and this play totally mirrors totally reflects what's going on or has gone on in um, the Congo um, during these wars that have been taking place there. And we'll get to that here in a second. So I wanted to tie in your last topic, the actor or acting, and I've given you a, a slide or some information from a slide directly from uh, the acting module. So it's a little bit of a review, but I want you to use it in terms of this play and how, again, this empathy is generated, how we engage the audience through empathy. And that's what brings about the social change. And so we have our analytical tools and they're all different for each of us if we were to address the characters or the play. So we have it, we come to it with our own experience, just as if we were to walk up to a Picasso painting, we come to it with our own experience. But because we're all human beings, we have a lot in common. So we have a lot of experience that might be similar, but a lot that's different. So we have given circumstances. Those are the forces that are playing on um, the characters or the real people, if you will, in the Congo um, in terms of the setting and the people around them and all kinds of other forces, weather and, um, you know, all the economic, uh, political and government types of forces. So, so those have to be considered. Then we have the objectives for the characters. What are they fighting for? Then we have their obstacles. What's getting in the way? Then that promotes the obstacles and the objectives. Together combined, promote action. What choices do they make to, to fight, to continue to fight? What gets in the way of those actions, those choices that they're making? And then based upon those obstacles, and the forces that are playing upon them, what are the consequences? What actually happens to them? Do they overcome? Do they not overcome? Um, do they die? Do they live? Do they live in happily ever after or in total misery? So the, that's that's the consequences. How do they change too? All right, we we lost one loved one, but we saved another. So that's how they change, you see. Um, so this is how one begins to generate that empathy that is driven inside of a character or a script. All right, so take a little pause here. Look at this video. It's the actual um, two of the actors from the original production talking about... Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's not the original production. It's... Um, the 2011 production at the Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. So it's two actors talking about their, their work and their roles in doing their production. All right, so I've been talking a lot about given circumstances. The forces. The forces that are playing upon all of the people involved. All of the characters involved. And, and they can be boiled down to this. Place, time, history, economics, politics, culture... And then society, what, you know, and that takes us right back to the very beginning. What is culture? What is my culture? Um, what plays upon me or what plays upon the characters in this play or what plays upon the real people living in the Congo in terms of their social groups, their gender roles, their social standards, so on and so forth. 
So we here we have, of course, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, the play takes place during the Second Congolese War. Um, the history behind it uh, has got to do with colonization, economics. Um, the groups are, you know, financing themselves with the natural resources, the conflict minerals, the government versus the rebel militias, and maybe necessarily the government is not good, and the culture um, is very diverse and multiple there, many languages and many cultures in one location. And there we have a map so you can situate uh, the Congo amongst the rest of Africa there. All right, some very hard legacies, the background story to this area of the world, this area of Africa. Um, we have the colonialism and imperialism column right here with King Leopold, the Belgian Congo, independence from Belgium, and then the Mobatu era. And then we come to present day, 96, to about 2003, where uh, the natural resources, the conflict minerals, um, have become a source of fighting. There's lots of chaos. Rape is being used as a tool of war. And if you haven't read the play yet, then you will understand why this play is so powerful. Um, it costs so much money to go to school there, and we know that oftentimes education can be a healing force for um, war-torn countries or um, idle minds or idleness or just, you know, fixing things. So if you can't afford education, then it presents problems, right? And then this particular word still has lots of many diverse languages and cultures all in one place. So it's hard to unite the, these um, peoples. And um, yet we can see within the beauty of this particular play that Nottage has put together, there is enormous natural and human potential that is still present even after um these two Congolese and wars that um, Nottage references in her play and the other histories that have taken place in this area of the world. And it just demonstrates that the human beings are so resilient and can find ways to overcome. All right, so I keep referencing the Congolese Wars. There's two of them. It's This is very watered down, very pithy, very outlined. We could spend a whole entire course just talking about this particular, um, these two wars, the Congolese Wars. But um, in 96 through 97, the location was Zaire. And um, the result of that particular war was the Alliance of Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Congo had victory. They overthrew uh, the Mobatu regime. They installed, um, I can't pronounce his name, but the president of Congo at that point, And they became the Republic of Zaire, uh, was recognized in the DRC. Then we have the second uh, Congolesian War. Uh, called the Colton War, and it started, uh, so they had maybe a, about a year of maybe a little bit of rest. I'm sure there were still conflicts going on um, from 98 to um, present, because even though the United Nations came to some kind of agreement in 2003, it's still devastated. Um, so now it's, now it's just called the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's no real clear victory, but the withdrawal of Uganda and Rwandan troops that were trying to help, I guess, um, reach peace deals with the internal combatants, the militias, and, um, the armed conflict then that was between the DRC and the Hutu power groups. So currently, if you go to this link I've provided here, it can give you all of this in a nice article, you know, nice, nice format if you want to read up on this. Um, but basically, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is still struggling to recover from their their world wars. It's huge. I mean, some people, people put it on the scale as one of the world wars um, because millions have died between 98 and 2003. 
So former rebels joined a power-sharing government. Eastern regions are still pretty volatile despite the 2013 peace agreements. And then the Democratic Republic of Congo hosts the UN's largest peacekeeping mission. So it just takes enormous amount of um, help to keep the peace and keep the calm. So for a concise look, go ahead. You can push that link there for further information. So some cold, hard truths. This, this picture I found just breaks my heart. These children who are just in the midst of all this stuff, they have no idea about it, but they do now because they're living it. And then that, that link I have there is um, a beautiful photographer. Um, it just captures this beauty, even in the, the, the cold, hard truth, you know, even in the, the war-torn areas. Um, the particular photographer has just done a really nice job of capturing um, the pain and the beauty. And I, and I want you to go look at that because it is um, mind opening. When I, when I first started researching to do this play as a topic and um, I found that I thought it was a nice gem in order to get a feeling and an idea when I read the play, you know, how it could pull me in even more. And, and then I'll just go back to directing and design. That's what we would do as a director. We would, um, find these nuggets of inspiration that would pull us into the play. And that's how we're starting to generate empathy. So I mentioned the conflict minerals. Here they are in a nice little poster. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy groups helping and helping and, um, you know, trying to be a voice to say, you know, these, there's people being abused and um, like slaves and children and women and men um, just so that these militia groups can have money and make money and people in power abuse um, these natural resources so they can abuse, they abuse the people so they can get the money from them. But um, the biggest thing um, one on here is the Colton, the Tantalum, is uh, in cell phones and computers. It's in everything we use. And so it's huge um, necessity for life at this point. Um, I found this quote on a website called Raise Hope for the Congo, an exclamation point enough campaign. Uh, that is their um, t tag uh, of the name of their group. But it says the greed for Congo's natural resources has been a principal driver of atrocities and conflict throughout the Congo's tortured history. In eastern Congo today, these mineral resources are financing multiple armed groups, many of whom ma use mass rape as a deliberate strategy to intimidate and control local populations, thereby securing control of mines, trading routes, and other strategic areas. And I'm hoping that I'm getting the point across and that this play doesn't explicitly 100% show you this, but there, you know, there is that character in the play. I don't want to give too much away if you haven't read it yet, but you know, she represents this. She represents this particular atrocity that, that's occurred. And so we have the mines and the miners and these armed groups and these trading houses and exporters and transit countries, refiners, electronic companies. And you can see it's like this through line of how it ends up in yours and my hands. So the question is, is, is it, it's theater for social changes, making us think about, wow, do we need to do something about this? You know? So how do these forces influence the characters in the play? And so, you know, con to continue this idea of empathy and to this, this idea of how the actors work in terms of doing their job and bringing this play to life, here's a list of the characters in the play that have significant amounts of um, lines and actions in the play. And I want you to be able to answer this question for each one of these characters. What forces are influencing them? What, and if we go back to the given circumstances page, you know, what politics are playing on mom and naughty? And I'm not just talking about, you know, the big old government of the, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm talking about her own politics within her own little brothel. There's politics there. And then you could just apply the other ones. Economics. What economic forces are playing on her? And then we could do the same questions for each one of these characters. And I really want you to take time to consider this. Um, 
and you know you don't have to make just take notes on it you don't have to make you know write tons and tons about it but see if you can have an answer for each one of these based upon the slide that had the given circumstances on it where was that there there is 13 right here we go So my example for you would be, you know, I'll use Mama Nadi, the owner of the brothel set in the Congo. All right, well, there's some circumstances. Location, brothel, it's not pretty, um, but she protects and profits from the women. So there's a conflict right there. And their bodies have become a battleground between the government, the soldiers, and the rebel forces. And I might even add, you know, the battleground in terms of having to be at the brothel it's probably one of the safest places to be but not really so the question is, is is she good is she bad but what other choice does she have or does she have other choices so those are the questions you can ask after you address the given circumstances for each character you know well what other choices do they have okay well if they made those choices then a whole nother set of circumstances starts to play on them. Are they better for them or worse for them? And remember, in every good play, everyone is right. So it's kind of interesting, again, how we have this uh, strength of character coming up and um, full, rich, um, vivid, living beings. All right, so I've I've chunked out some scenes and monologues from this play for you to uh, further understand. But there again, I've I've put on the left column what forces are at play for each of these characters. Then in the other column, I went ahead and grabbed that those that information from that slide from the acting objectives obstacles. And so I have specific pieces of the script that I'd like for you to um, see if you can identify. What are the objectives for Sophie? What's she fighting for? When you read and listen to this scene for Salima, what are her objectives? What is she fighting for? And then in this scene, can you identify the obstacles? What's getting in her way? What's getting in the way um, for Salima? What actions do they actually make to continue fighting? So on and so forth. Do they win? Do they lose? What's their outcome? What What are their consequences? So you can read along in your book, page 31, and she starts with smile, Salima, talk pretty. And um, so that's one I want you to consider. And then I have this fantastic monologue picked out from Mama Nadi on um, page 86. And she starts with, you men kill me. And I've just used dot, dot, dots, ellipses uh, to get you to the very end of that particular monologue. And monologues are compressed. Um, dialogue not dialogue unilogue monologue um for one character and it's usually very emotional and there's usually it, it follows the same arc as a story or a play and it usually starts off with you know a couple inciting incidences and it builds and it builds until it combusts and it's very emotionally packed monologues typically are you know 10 20 some can be three pages long um, but this is one example of a monologue from the play. So I want you to address these two things in terms of these questions. So you can gain or glean one final other thing. If you remember our play lighting lecture, the sum of all the parts and elements that go into writing a script or a character would be the theme. What concepts jump out at you after you've addressed those questions I just asked you to do? The rules of the world now are very clear to you based upon those, just those two characters in that scene and Mama Nadi in the monologue. The world that's inside versus the world outside. Mama enforces the rules. Men change character. The only safe place for women. How safe, how not safe. So this is their little world, the brothel. Um, there's rules. And the girls know the rules. Mama Naughty runs a, a tight ship because she doesn't want to be cheated on. Um, then the women's bodies are used as a battleground. And I would have to say, it's not in the play, but the, the poor children of the Congos um, were equally victimized. Um, so no one's safe. The chief's daughter, a middle-class girl, rural peasants. We have, we actually have social status of women within the brothel. 
uh, Mama Nadi, Sophie, Salima, Josephine. Then we have Social Status, and we have um, Christian Fortune, Osimbenga, and Kisembe. And then we also have, which is, so, that's I think why this makes this place so extraordinary because there is compassion and hope and joy even in the midst of this ugliness and this um devastation so there is music in the play there is song there's humor how do these characters survive and heal what does mama Nadi give why does mama Nadi give the diamond to sophie and how does mommy Nadi change at the end that's such a beautiful such a beautiful ending Addition, additional great photos from other productions of the of the script. All right, so here's some additional scenes for you and a monologue in there, another monologue, uh, because you do have an assignment. Um, part of this is to write a monologue, and you'll find those instructions with your discussion board assignment. But um, here are some other scenes to run the same questions by. What are they fighting for? What are their obstacles? Uh, what are their actions and what are their consequences? And you can you can do that same analysis with each of these scenes. And it'll give you plenty to talk about in terms of um, your minute post, in crafting your own monologue, and then the same exercise is really, this is a really good um, warm-up for writing your formal paper, and then it's also an excellent warm-up for your final exam. So I've thoroughly enjoyed going over uh, this play. We're at the end, and here we are at the hope. We're, we're at the theater for social change where, that provides hope. What is it that a play can do? So I have this short snippet here. Um, at the time the play came out, UN Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and High Commissioner for Humanity Rights Navi Pillay, both of these persons attended the play um, in June of 2009 when the play had first opened. And I want you to listen to what he has to say in this interview, and it's fantastic. Then I found this other international advocacy group, and it just discusses, you know, how they're helping women who have been raped in the Congo. And then I provide these last two videos um, just to expose and make you aware of, you know, some very harsh things that do go on in this area so that the play continues to resonate with you um, after we're done with the course and you've left um, the journey with me um, that I hope that the beauty of this play has really spoken to you. All right. And that brings us to the end of the topic, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it.